I am very interested in the juxtaposition of what's real and then what's imagined and trying to put them both into the same painting. And also like you're sort of surrounded, we're all surrounded, not just artists, by our inner world. Yeah. Um, and making those things visible and also kind of battling with them or dealing with them or bringing them out has been the theme of my work for years. In fact, my masters, which I did, you know, nearly 30 years ago, God, nearly 30 years ago, um, 20 something years ago, uh, was on that theme. So it's, oh, it's a thing it? that I've, I've I just, it's a thing that I'm always interested in. I mean, behind us are some older paintings. And actually, um, even though these are old ones, because obviously all this other work is in King Street Gallery in Sydney right now, you know, some of these are about that. I mean, there is a ghost painting, but this one is a painting from a few years ago called Night Magic. And um, she is there as an artist, but she's also like a magician and she's kind of conjuring up things and making art materials float around and ideas are coming and going. Yeah, well, the other great thing about that world is that, you know, you've got, you, get, you can just go crazy with colour and light. You can do anything. I mean, <laughs> after all, when you're dealing with that, look, that painting, which is not about that, it's the witches from Macbeth, it's got a cloud walking behind these witches. Yeah. There's a cloud with legs walking down behind them. What's going on? We don't know. It's witchy world, it's magic, we don't need to really know. Well, wasn't that, didn't that cause a furor back in the day a few years ago? It did, it was, it was like, it was a few years ago. Um, John Bell, Bell Shakespeare, was just retiring and leaving after 25 years of running that company. And he had this really nice idea of asking a number of artists to make work about either a Shakespearean play or a line from Shakespeare. And um, asked, I was one of the artists who was asked, I thought, well, obviously I'm going to do the witches. And I actually had painted witches before when I was in my 20s, but who'd resist the witches from Macbeth? Yeah. So I did this painting. He loved it. They loved it. It was on the cover of the catalogue. It travelled round Australia, all good. When it went to Parliament House, Craig Kelly, a Liberal Party politician, was so horrified by it because it's naked and it was in Parliament House, even though it wasn't permanent, it was just travelling past and a, a temporary exhibition, that there was a huge furor for a few days. It was, <laughs> it was like social media had hashtag I'm with a bum. Uh, it was on TV <laughs> news. It was ridiculous. And it was really funny because when it happened, I, I, w I was having an exhibition in Berlin and I was on a different time zone so I turn my phone off before I go to bed. When I wake up, pick up my phone and it's gone crazy. Um, it was good because I could show off, OK, I'm in Berlin. That made me sound good. But what was bad was that I, although I did cash in on it somewhat, I missed the exact moment because of the time zone thing. I, it couldn't get me because I was oh, asleep. No. So they couldn't get a comment. But I did get comments, but I would have got even more. And some people <laughs> said, oh, I hope you're not offended. And I thought, look, it's just so ridiculous what he said, that it was like the best free publicity you could, you could have. Oh, totally. And it's also, what, it's not as if it's 1950. Well, look, it's ridiculous. And what one of my friends said, rather wittily said about that, it's just a bum, nothing going in, nothing coming out, <laughs> which is true it's con and also look it's the witches from Macbeth yeah, so it yeah, is it yeah, is yeah. amazing that that people can still be so shocked by something which is so obviously not rude yeah um, there's the naked character one of the witches in the, the witches from Macbeth if you read the play it doesn't really describe what they're like so when you look through images of the witches uh whether that's from stage productions or film or painting or you can do anything because they're just witches. I mean, they can be, they can look however you like and you can just do anything with them. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because with your work, um, do you gravitate towards ideas where you can have that freedom? To or to, usually, well, see, that's unusual because that's, I'm actually trying to make it a specific thing, which is actually these witches from Macbeth. Nothing else, everything else is my own imagined thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was nice about that is it's totally open what you do with it. Um, whereas everything else is from me, so um, I, can, I can have anything going on any way I like and create my own world which can make sense in its own strange way.
Yeah. Well, actually, one of the works that I particularly liked in the show is called Fluid Time. Mm. And because I feel as though that really portrays your confidence and fearlessness as a painter. I mean, because there are so many elements to it which one would think would ordinarily compete with each other, but they end up working together. Yes, uh, thanks Maria, and, that's, and that's, that is definitely something that I like to do. And if you look at, say, the paintings in this exhibition, Magic, you can see a lot where I've done just what you're talking about with taking disparate things that don't usually relate together and getting them to work. I think if you can get things that, like for example, in some paintings, like there's a painting called Walking Home of me carrying a big doll-like version of myself, mm. there is crazy, there's two characters of me and the doll, but then there is also a bit of glowing colour which is in spray paint, there's a reasonably realistic little bit of a streetscape, there is all these things which are all quite different languages and look a bit like different things, but if you can make those different things to come together and somehow make sense, it's more exciting than if there's a sameness and that's, that's also including the way I use the paint. So I also do try, quite often, to have some areas which are smoother and shinier, some areas which are coarser and rougher, um, a range of different marks and a range of different languages, if you like. Yeah. And so, so when you're developing the painting, does that feel like an instinctive process? It's, in, it's instinctive to a degree and, and not, it's both. So sometimes I will have said, you know, for example, um, there's one called The Wheel of Fortune, which is, um, there's one with paper dolls and there's a woman looking into the distance and there's, I, I wanted to include some areas with soft, blurry, amorphous, it's actually spray paint, but you wouldn't know really what it was, cloudy sort of softness. And then some areas which are quite realistic and quite clear. I knew I wanted to do that, but you still let it evolve. Things. Paintings always evolve and you never really know. I think I always think you need to have some idea, but not complete idea. If I knew exactly what it looked like, I wouldn't want to paint it. Yeah. And you were talking about uh, the, the painting Walking Home, which I love because I saw it in the Porsche Geach actually exhibition. It was a finalist in that, oh, in that competition. And um, I noticed that it, it deals with a theme which you've painted before. Yes. In particular, your Sulman Prize painting, Erskineville Train Station, also deals with that idea of yes. walking yes, you're right. to you're the studio. Right. From the studio. No, you're quite right. So where we are in this fantastically huge studio that I'm so lucky to be in, big warehouse, is about 25 minutes to half an hour walk from my house. And um, I do that every day, walking back and forth. And it is a time when you're it's sort of a liminal in-between time between being at home and then being here when you're thinking about what you're going to do. And because I walk it all the time and I'm down back streets, I'm sort of on automatic pilot. Yeah. Um, and it is, it, 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 it's again what I was talking about, I guess, is you're doing something, you might be thinking about something quite banal, like I think I need to buy some more milk before I go home. <laughs> but you also can sort of go into a dream world where, you, where you're fantasizing about something that you should be painting or about to do or something. And uh, I do love, as I said, the real and the unreal in one, in one work and, um, and also different marks, which is different paint marks and different surfaces, which is what I, I try to do. Yeah. That's interesting about saying that ideas come to you in, those, in that time. Mm. You know, I find that ideas come to me in the shower. Do you have... Do you, Look, that a... it's very interesting because one of the questions that... The most com common questions that artists get asked is how long did it take you to paint that thing or whatever it is? And uh, I remember once discussing this with a writer and she said that when she's asked that, she always says, do I count the bit where I'm walking the dog? And that's... I don't have a dog, but it's a very good one because... That when she's walking the dog, she's not actually writing, but she is thinking about it. It's still part of it. Because you, you only get ideas, you don't get ideas out of nowhere. You only get ideas if it's going on in your head anyway, usually when you're actually drawing, which is where I'm sitting over here drawing. And I'm thinking, I'd like to do this. Does it look like this? Does it look like that? So I'm doing actual, it's really quite scribbly, like actually, oh, I know what I can show you. It's actually quite scribbly. I just remembered that I've got a sketchbook which has got things like carrying the doll, oh, wow. things like that, you know. So I have... Oh, so that is... 
This right. is actually, this is thinking drawings. These are not a beautiful, look how beautifully I can draw drawing. Um, I have one of the paintings in the exhibition is called Hocus Pocus. And I have a, a woman standing holding an eye over her eyes. Yes, yes, yes. You know, when I'm working that out, I'm thinking, is she sitting down? Is she standing? In the painting, she's standing. But in an early form, yeah, she's sitting right. down. It's, it's just, these are like getting what's out of your head and making it actually visible. Otherwise, you don't know what it looks like. And you have to know. And also, you, might, for, you like. might forget it. Well, you do. That's right. Oh, actually, there's another one that's like that of her walking home. There's different things behind that to the painting. I don't have... In this, I've got someone bending, someone sitting down on the ground. I've got a figure in the distance. That's not in the painting, mm. but the walking one is. This is a design for a painting that is that is actually in that exhibition. Uh, and uh, is that watercolour? No, this is, this is gouache. Oh, okay. So it's all sort of an opaque version of watercolour. Um, but a lot of these, yeah, so this is, this is, I always have lots of these books of what looks like absolute scribble and is absolute scribble but is actually important to me um, that most of the paintings in Magic are from my imagination, but there are a few that are from models. There's a large painting painted on black, um, which is called Forever is Composed of Nows, which is a painting of a young woman and an older woman. Yeah, that's um, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Those, that's from two models, uh, as you would probably guess. Yeah. Um, there's also, there are a few others from models. There's another one called um, Other People's Monsters and that is from two models. Two models and our friend the uh, paper mache queen in the background That's over right. there. This is a little drawing for that. So when the, the, oh, the, the, okay. the, the, the drawing of, of Other People's Monsters, like I had the two models there. Yeah. This is me working out where am I going to put them just a scribble, planning drawing, a design drawing, not a lovely drawing of someone's hand, but a where are they drawing? Yeah. And then what I do, just as a little tip, I draw a line ha roughly, don't measure it, roughly halfway, roughly halfway on my compositional sketch and then the same on my canvas, just a mark, so that I know, for example, here I can see that her head is slightly to one side of the middle and it's oh, up okay. from the halfway. Just, it's not like a complicated no, grid. I would no. never do that. It's just a little guide. Yeah, to give you an idea. Yes. Oh, so the grid is not for compositional purposes. It's just to sort of help me know if I think that looks yes. right, just so I can translate these things into approximately the same position on the actual canvas. Oh, it's so interesting yeah. seeing the drawings. Yeah, no, so it's, yeah, because, you know, there's heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps. And there's, I have tons of these books, but that's the one that's relevant. And what's, what that, pencil do you use? I'd rather use a soft pencil. If that is a pencil, it probably is a pencil. If that is a pencil, um, then it's, yeah, probably that. But, I mean, i have just grab anything for that because it's... Um... But, yeah. you know, what's interesting is that these books of ideas um, are actually the most interesting things for you as an artist rather than quite a nice life drawing or a drawing of a foot that doesn't really mean anything because this is what you're thinking. Yeah. Yeah, and you're not pouring over it. You're not sort of concentrating. It's, it's like thinking. Ages. It's like, what happens if she stands up? What happens if she sits down? Hmm, she's sitting down. Maybe she's doing this. Or no, maybe she's not. Maybe one idea leads to another. But you need to see what it looks like. It, it can't just be in your head because we're talking about visual art. Let's see it. Even if it's a scribble that, even if when you look at those drawings I just showed you and you can't really understand what they are, I can. And that's. That's, you know, I know what that wiggly thing means in the corner, or maybe I don't, but, you know, I can decide what it is. Yeah. But it's just to sort of get it out of your head. I, in order to do that, you have to sort of almost be in the zone to do that drawing. You absolutely do. You need to be, you do. To do that type of drawing, you need to be, I think, you need to be on your own, or at least feel like you're on your own, but I think you need to be on your own. It might even just be sitting in your own world somewhere. I guess you could even be on a bus if you can get away from people mentally. But you need to be doing it where no one else is looking at what you're doing so that you don't censor yourself. Yeah. And I don't mean censor yourself because it's rude. I mean censor yourself because it might be dumb. So you think, so you're not thinking, oh, I better not do that, be silly. Just go with the flow. Yeah. What happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? And you will find that if you do enough of that, you will start to work out 
what you want to say, what the composition is, and all sorts of ideas. I think, you know, that's the time when you absolutely need to focus. And although uh, I do, I listen to music, but I also listen a lot to podcasts and audio books. I can't listen to an audio book when I'm doing that or anything, because you really need to be just kind of going into your own world a bit, you know, yes. you can't, you can't listen to words while you're trying to do that. No, totally. And would you always need to do a sketch like that before you start the painting? I would always do that, even if it's as scribbly as one of those. See, different things with different paintings. Sometimes I do a painting, I do a little study first, but even if I don't do a study, I would always do at least just a little compositional scribble like I showed you there. Yeah. And talking about the paper mache figure, because yeah. it does appear in a few paintings uh, in this show. Yes. And, um, and when it's next to other figures, it's clear that that form is not like a human form. Yes, and I, I want it to be like, you, she's not human, but, but I also like, what is she? You know, like in the painting, Other People's Monsters, there's these two people, there's one woman who looks like a real woman who's naked sitting thoughtfully in the front. The other one is wearing some really weird, crazy outfit. Is she really there? And then that other one, <laughs> is she complete? Is that something that, what does that symbolise? And is, I'm assuming that that's something she's imagined. But when they, the two models that I had there, Annie and Rosie actually sat for me, um, they did have her as their third friend model, which is her here. Yeah. And um, she was sitting next to them. So she does exist physically in the world. I mean, she might not have, but she actually does. And you made her? I made her, yeah. I realise I've got to fix her neck. She's got a neck problem at the moment, but um, <laughs> she's, she's paper mache. Inside her is bubble wrap. So she's very light, which is yeah, right. quite portable yeah. and really fun. It's a great idea to include a sculpture in your painting. Yeah. You know, and it then takes on a different significance. Well it, again it's that real and unreal so you've got a real person and you've got her. Um, it's actually quite nice. I mean of course you could just make her up as well yeah. but it is actually there's something quite lovely about the fact that I know she really does exist and that's what she always wears. Yeah <laughs> and I, I just love that wall of small paintings that are in King Street Gallery right now and they're in these amazingly unusual frames which I understand you found in flea markets in Paris. Yes, they are mostly from there. I mean, that because I do usually live in Paris part of each year, and I love flea markets, I am there all the time looking for frames. And that's where most of them come from. Some are from elsewhere, different places, but that's predominant. And um, I love the fact that a lot of them are about 100 years old or more. Wow. And you just think what, sometimes there was an old photo in, which is really, you feel sort of bad taking it out. Um, or you think, what was in that frame? What was there? Was that on someone's mantelpiece? Was it wallpaper behind? Who owned it? You know, what was next to it? They're, they're so um, rich in history, but you don't know what it is. Uh, and, and I've painted little, like the light, little fragments of ideas in them. And all of the paintings actually in this show, including the little ones and the big ones, all of them are like a narrative, but they're totally open-ended. So none of them are an illustration of anything in particular. It's up to you to look at it and to work out what's going on. Yeah. And you know, I realise, yes. uh, I was just thinking yesterday actually, that the thing that really brings you back, not just to paintings, but to any image, is when you don't quite know what's there. If you've got it all, you go, like usually an ad for something, because advertising, you want it, got it, got it. If it's the thing, what's she thinking? Who are they? What's happening? Why is that? Whatever you're thinking like that, that keeps bringing you back because it's always tantalising you as opposed to, there it all is, got it. Yeah, exactly. No, and those, are, those paintings do have that about them. They're amazing. Thank They're... you. Now, I wanted to take you back. We were talking earlier about drawing and you were saying that you did have some life models and that reminds me of you being in that amazing SBS show called Life Drawing Live which was basically in that dark ISO period. Yes, yes. I remember it because I remember watching it on TV and it's a live life drawing It was class. utterly live. It was so innovative and I remember a yes. lot of my uh, podcast listeners were just raving about it. We were so excited It's a shame they it. don't do it again. What was really fabulous about it was that it was 
uh, it was real. I mean, that the the because the, when I agreed to do that, and there were these people who were well-known people who were who were standing drawing. I was thinking, I wonder if they're really going to draw. No, they were earnestly trying their best to draw. And so, you know, although there was a rove made it fun and there was a bit of an entertainment thing, it was still quite a real life drawing it class. It was, it was really serious. Yeah, which was yeah. really fantastic and gosh, there's none of that on television. I mean, it was, it was so great and it was very popular because, you know, they, they had audience participation where the audience could send drawings in. And they were thinking, well, oh dear, I hope, I hope we get some. Oh God, what are we going to do? <laughs> they got, I can't remember how many. Oh, they got, they got so many. I want to say 4,000, but that, I don't remember how many, but they got a huge, it was huge. They were inundated. And this that's is in just, real time. And that's in real time. And that's yeah. just people who sent drawings in, not people who just drew and didn't. Yeah, that's and, right. It, but it was incredibly difficult to do, for me I'm talking, for us, Mary Ann Coots and I, yeah. um, who were the people that were the artists, you know, in that, um, because it truly is live. So it's not like when I'm talking to you, Maria, when I, if I, if suddenly, I don't know, I make some terrible mistake or I, whatever, you can edit it out. It ain't edited. Right. It's scary right. because it's really live and um, anything could happen because it's truly live. And also because of, as you said, COVID factor, you couldn't go over to someone. And when you're talking to someone about life drawing and they're looking at a model, you want to put your head very close to them so you can both see the same angle. Of course. Because if, you're, yeah. if they're down and you're up, it looks different. Yeah. But you can't go too near, so they have to go away. And there's, all, there's added difficulties that made it harder. But it was, you know, I think it was a great thing to do. And I do wish that there were more things like that on television. Yeah. Well, I heard of people saying that, you know, they started watching it and they just had to grab a pencil. And they never intended that they were going to be doing that. But it was so... Yeah, it, it, demysti it demystifies the whole thing. The other thing that was really great, I mean, they did so many good things with it, was that they had a range of different models, different ages, different types. That's right. Um, which I think people who think that think it's some kind of peep show realise absolutely isn't. That's right. Now it's fantastic. Yeah. I thought so too. Now, also, congratulations on becoming a finalist in the Archibald. This is your seventh time, and of yes. course, you've been a winner, a previous yes. winner. And I loved that painting of Thank Magda Subansky. I'm going to show you a little study for it because we're here and oh, I can. Oh, brilliant! I've got. I'm showing you. This is just. These were just thinking drawer thinking paintings just on cheap little canvases when I'm thinking okay how am I going to paint her when I decided what I was going to do first of all I thought is she sitting down and then I thought no and then I thought no she is standing so that was these are just quick thinking what does it look like paintings before I actually painted the real thing wow yeah that is so interesting because I think one of the most interesting things about that painting well it's called Magda Zubansky comedy and tragedy and it's the way in which you captured those two conflicting ideas and we all know Magda Zubansky is the character of Sharon but yes. to depict her in that way can you tell me a bit about how yes. that came about it is interesting I had read her wonderful autobiography Reckoning um, where she starts off with a line talking about her father who was uh, in the Polish resistance and was an assassin. He was only in his teens and he was you know, on the good side, fighting against the Nazis, saving Jewish people, things like that. But still he was killing people mm. and obviously that's going to affect him and you know, passing that down affects her too, as all kinds of trauma does when it goes down through generations. And she talks obviously in that book and very publicly about it. It's all really fascinating. Um, so I was really interested in that. And then of course, you know, I thought she was so wonderful during the gay marriage debate and how she, you know, talked about that and her work for human rights and all the things that she does yeah. besides being so funny and clever. And um, I don't usually do this because I've never really sort of approached someone I don't know like this, but I thought, I would really like to paint her because I was also doing work into my own family history at the same time. And so I actually approached her agent and I was delighted when they said yes and that Magda said yes. They said, oh yes, we love your work. We'd love you to do it. Wow. 
And then I thought, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do because I didn't want to paint her as Sharon initially because she is Sharon. Sharon is funny, but she, there's also a bit of sadness underneath. Yeah. Um, but that's only a small part of Magda. I wanted to make it more about Magda. And uh, then, so if I paint Magda, what does she look like? Well, she looks just like a normal woman with blonde hair, probably wearing black in Melbourne, drinking coffee, which is very nice, but that's not, that doesn't tell us about her. Yeah. So I was trying to think, oh, what will I do? All the ideas that I came up with were fairly corny. I didn't like them. And I was thinking, oh, I've never, done, I've never really got myself into something like that before where I don't know. Usually I have an idea, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't want to do it. Anyway, this was early this year when you were allowed to move around. She came up here to Sydney from Melbourne. She came to the studio and we had this very intense conversation for three hours, sitting knee to knee virtually. And wow. during this conversation, she said, let me tell you what my favourite painting is. And her favourite painting is a painting by a 19th century Polish artist called Jan Marteko. And it's a painting of a jester wearing red, slumped forward, looking totally downcast and distraught in a darkened room. It's like his backstage, he's actually just in an antechamber, but like his backstage. And he's about to go on and entertain people and be all bright and cheery. But he has just read this news about a Polish defeat in a war that was going on at the time. But he has to forget it and just go on as a comedian. Anyway, she said, that's me, that's me. And I thought, I know what I'm going to do. So I'm painting her as what her famous comic creation, but I'm also painting all of that sort of trauma and all sorts of things that she's dealing with, but we're all dealing with behind her. Yes. So I was thinking of having her standing there as Sharon, kind of, but staring at us and actually looking like she is genuinely shocked and haunted and about to burst into tears. And behind her is burning buildings that originally I was thinking is her father's Second World War, but I deliberately didn't make the buildings very specific. So although I was thinking of that initially, it was also the bushfires that she'd just been raising money for. It's also all the human rights work that she's done. And although COVID hadn't actually kicked in, it's kind of that too, because it's really just about having to deal with, having to carry on and go about what you have to do with something terrible going on in the background, which all of us, all humans, have terrible times when you're in grief, you've just had a terrible breakup, you, something yeah, terrible yeah. has happened, and you still have to go Carry on. on. But when you're in the public eye, much worse. Yeah. Totally. Um, and I think that's right. I think it's a human experience, yes. and that's what you've tapped into there. And I think, that, I think that's what it is that makes it so relatable. Well, also, I made sure that, again, what we were talking about with real and unreal, she's standing behind these, in front of these burning buildings, but I, I wanted to make it deliberately unclear whether these are real, whether it's a backdrop, or whether it's something she's imagined. But I knew that whatever it was, it's real enough to actually cast light on her. So it's doing, it's burning, yeah. but there's a bit of red, there's red light on her. So it's actually affecting her, it's not separate but we don't know whether it's real or not. It's an ambiguous space where she's in, uh, which is, you know, I mean, it's, it was an interesting, it, interesting. I wanted to do it, like whenever I paint, whenever I do paint a portrait, I would never want to just do a straight lightness of someone because I'm just not interested. I want to say something more and I want something that's challenging. And the challenge was that was, can I paint this comic character and yet make her look genuinely haunted and sad and all of this? And can I then connect her very weirdly to all this burning buildings and stuff behind. Can you do these things and make them come together? But it, was, it, but it is interesting that if Magda hadn't told me that, I wouldn't have come up with that idea. My painting doesn't look like the painting that she likes, but it certainly has a similar art concept. I could talk to you all day about what you've been up to in the last year, because you know it includes 
that amazing mural in Newtown, the Women Empowerment Mural, uh, your upcoming collaboration with novelist and poet Kate Forsyth, your travel to Ethiopia where you painted and raised money for the Catherine Hamlin Fistula Foundation. And that doesn't include your solo shows, your finalist paintings in so many competitions. Been busy. It's been busy. <laughs> it has been. <laughs> Do you feel it's important to you to have these projects to focus on? So have something on the boil, have something in the future? I don't know. I, I, look, I've always got so many things on at the same time. Uh, I seem to always have lots of things going on as you, in the background. They're like little boilers in the background. You come back and do a bit on that. Uh, look, I don't know, but I, I, I actually have, fingers crossed, the life that I've always wanted, I guess, where I'm doing all sorts of different things. They're all painting and drawing. It's all using the, the same sort of concepts in a way, but I'm not doing the same thing over and over again. So, you know, so, so say for example, working with a writer, I'm also working with, uh, on a ballet um, and I'm working on a cabaret. These things, they're all, I'm painting on things, I'm making things. So they're all just painting and drawing, but they're in different ways. And mm. those sorts of collaborations are really fun um, and I'm also, you know, as you've mentioned, this huge mural, I'm going to be painting another big uh, wall paintings in a Mossman Art Gallery later in the year. You know, it's really great to do these things as well as easel paintings, which I also love doing. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. yeah, it's fantastic. I am very lucky. Oh, it's fantastic. And, you know, it's just such a pleasure to be with you here in the studio and catch up. Thanks for your time, Wendy. Thank you, Maria. Thanks so much.